Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you're tuning in around the world for this latest Reuters event supply chain webinar discussing supply chain visibility and the need to break down silos within supply chain. Um, me and Jamie are co-hosting today's webinar just in case uh, any London storms impact today's broadcast. If I jump off, uh, Jamie can take over, vice versa. Uh, we have a, an incredible lineup of, of thought leaders on today's um, webinar discussing this very important topic. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce all the uh, speakers, starting off with, with Kendra from, from RIDA. Good morning, Kendra. Good morning. How are you, Nick? I'm doing very well. How about yourself? Good, thanks. Um, so I, my name is Kendra Phillips. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for our Supply Chain Division at Rider Systems. And for those who don't know us, we're a supply chain and logistics leader. We're mainly focused in North America. We have warehousing, e-commerce, last mile fulfillment, and transportation solutions. And we've been around for over 85 years, so we have quite a history. Excellent. And next up, we have Cindy from Domino's. Thanks, Nick. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone around the world. My name is Cindy Hayden. I've been with Domino's for the past uh, five years. And prior to that, heavy background in CPG at, uh, at PepsiCo and Campbell Soup. Uh, Domino's is a global brand, uh, but the supply chain operations I have responsibility for are primarily the US and Canada. Thanks for having me, Nick. Excellent. And next up, we have Eric from T-Mobile. Good day, everyone. My name is Eric Laval. I am the leader of product and technology supply chain for T-Mobile. Um, in that role, uh, we do everything from ensuring that the customer experience is the one that you want to have for the supply chain components uh, related to our brand promise uh, and the technology delivery for all of the things that help support that. I've been with the firm about three and a half years. Uh, my background is in the retail industry. Uh, and I was delighted to find that uh, a huge component of T-Mobile, besides our primary product uh, of our network, um, is that, that retail experience for our consumers. So glad to be here with you and uh, glad to join these panelists and share some thoughts today. Excellent. And last but not least, we have Greg from CFI and TFI International. Hey, thanks, Nick. Good afternoon. Good, good evening. Good morning. Um, Greg Orr, uh, president of CFI and EVP of U.S. Truckload for TFI. So uh, TFI uh, is based out of Canada. We're about a $5 billion organization and ultimately uh, support transportation opportunities across North America. Uh, CFI is based in Joplin, Missouri, and we're about 2,000 trucks and uh, also support Transport America and the newly acquisition uh, in our U.S. Truckload division called MCT. So we're, we're very excited to be here and participate in uh, today's call. Excellent. Thanks a lot for that, Greg. To, so to kick off the today's conversation, obviously supply chain visibility is, is a much discussed term in the industry. Um, so to start off with some, some general thoughts um, with Kendra, what does, what does supply chain visibility mean to you? So supply chain visibility is talked about a lot and it's a very broad term. To some, it's a dot on a map tracking an asset. To others, it's a lot more complex. Personally, I think of supply chain visibility as the ability to see your supply chain end to end, to see all your orders and items in transit real time, to see what's happening within the four walls of your warehouse. What's the status of all your SKUs in the warehouse? What's on order and what's inbound to a DC? Visibility should really enable you not just to see your supply chain, but to act on it, to know when something's going wrong or is about to go wrong and then have the ability to take action and correct the disruption. Today, visibility is essential to running an efficient supply chain. Thanks, Nick. Excellent, perfect. So I guess bringing in Eric then for some general thoughts, what does, what does supply chain visibility mean to you? Um, you know, expanding on what Kendra said, um, the not only knowing about it, but the ability to act on it. And I think that's going to be one of the things we'll talk about as we uh, speak about digital supply chain coming up. Um, you know, I have always viewed uh, the supply chain uh, end to end as kind of a clockwork, um, or you can think of it as the butterfly effect. Uh, something that happens upstream uh, can have a significant effect downstream. A small change in a plan 
or a forecast uh, may have big impacts on suppliers, on physical transportation, uh, et cetera, or a customer event can have that as well. So uh, it's the complexity of all of the elements that can come in and influence uh, what happens in your supply chain operation. And again, your ability to meet customer expectations um, and then the ability to react to those. So um, yeah, I think that's you know some of the components that are part of that. Excellent. So I think obviously reacting is, is a key component to, to the whole supply chain visibility discussion. So bringing in, I guess, Cindy, for, for some general thoughts, what does, what does supply chain visibility mean to you? So I'm going to go back to what, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, something Kendra said, and that is <clears throat> the end-to-end -end visibility. So if I think about our business, I'd like to know the demand at the store level and be able to tag that without touching it all the way back to bring in raw input from our supplier base. That is true end to end. And if you had the visibility of each component, they were tied to one another and you never had to touch it from your consumer demand signal back to your supplier order. That to me is true end to end visibility. Excellent. Um, so it's bringing in Greg. Um, obviously we've had three very good answers there on supply chain visibility. Is there anything that, that you wanna to add to, to the conversation? You know, I think the team did a great job in laying out um, a very clear picture. The only thing that I would probably add at this point is, you know, it depends on the seat that you're in too, right? So uh, being that I'm the only provider of services, or I shouldn't say the only, but uh, a provider of services from a transportation perspective, everybody has a complete different view of what that means. And in some cases, you know, if I look at it from an asset provider's perspective, um, today, I would tell you that it's really about control and, and how we manage freight across our network and be able to provide that to multiple customers or multiple sectors of the business. And, uh, you know, as we get deeper into the conversation, I'm sure this will come up, but I think one of the challenges that will really uh, paint a clear picture is everybody has a complete different view of what all these things mean. And I think that's really what's gonna be really intriguing about the rest of this conversation. So we look forward to that. If I may, Nicholas, um, I think one other component, um, extending on what Cindy said, um, it's certainly the right things uh, as she talked about uh, the components in the end to end. I think the how you have the visibility is a super important part that we're only beginning to get mature at. Um, and when I uh, say that, I'm referring to things like literal visualizations, um, you know, the, the matchup of lines of demand versus lines of supply, um, things like that, real-time dashboards, um, the, in, the immediate visibility of complex things that are happening kind of behind the scenes. Um, you know, in my experience in uh, olden days of uh, even a few years ago, you know, grid-based printed reports that run every morning and thing, big stacks that are on printers and distributed to people's desks or emails even with those same kind of grid-based things, I think are uh, a very different uh, view from what you can get as you begin to combine data in more sophisticated ways. Um, I've also noticed that um, it's interesting who brings that component to the conversation with business partners. Um, I've used the phrase that Eskimos don't know how to ask for pizza. If you've never had pizza, you might not know how great it is. So, you know, uh, making business partners aware of the possibilities of, hey, you can have a, a real-time dashboard. You can click on a red bubble and see what the problem is, um, rather than having to go find it deep in a report. So that element of how we have visualization, I think, is another important one. And it takes different skills and talent to bring that to the table and to offer those capabilities, which then change how the business operates. Perfect. Um, that, I, th I think that, that brings us really well onto, onto the next point about barriers. So obviously most companies want supply chain visibility, but in many cases it is you know, blue sky thinking. So, so bringing in Kendra, what are some of the guess the common barriers to, to enter and visibility in supply chain? Well, I think Eric described it perfectly. Um, you know, it is surprising, but in today's world, supply chains are still very paper-paced. Um, you think we'd be beyond that, but in reality, we really aren't. Uh, it's something I believe collectively as an industry we need to focus on. It's really digitizing the supply chain. So moving beyond visibility into that digitization 
And really that applies to what Cindy described as well. So those would be things like having electronic bill of ladings and e-signatures or real-time proof of delivery as norms. Um, another barrier is the fact, and I think Eric, you were also describing this, but it's the fact that we have so many different players involved in a supply chain. So you're gonna have the supplier, shippers, carriers, 3PLs, consignees, and numerous of all these folks in every supply chain. And everyone has their own technology systems and their own processes. So we can't have true end to end visibility until we break down those silos, hence the topic of the conversation, right? Um, amongst all those players in the supply chain. And, and this is really what we're focused on at Rider. So we have a, a technology platform that enables our customers to break down those exilo, excuse me, break down those silos that exist between them as shippers and their other partners in the supply chain. With our technology, which is called Rider Share, everyone in the supply chain is able to see the same information at the same time, communicate in platform over a specific shipment, order, or SKU. And if there's a disruption, they can actually solve that problem together looking at real-time data. And that's the type of thing I really believe we need. We need to be able to bring players together and merge all these different technologies and enable folks to see the same information, see it in real time, and then communicate about it together. And that's what will enable us to um, break down these barriers and enable true visibility. Excellent. So um, I guess to, to Kendra's point there around, you know, the, the paper-based nature of, of supply chain, um, bringing in, I guess, Cindy here, what, what are your thoughts on kind of overcoming some of the barriers that, that we're seeing to full-scale end-to-end visibility, like you mentioned in, in your first answer? Yeah, so I mean, Kendra really spoke well about it and, and I'm pretty much where she is with with one ad, um, as you join all the systems together for both your internal constituents and your external constituents, whether it's your 3PL, your providers, et cetera, one of the keys, especially I know that our company is extraordinarily sensitive to is cybersecurity. Hmm. You know, if you ask um, our leadership, we would say the two things that haunt us at night are food safety and cybersecurity. So as you do this with disparate systems, not only internally, but externally across your network with everyone that you need to hook into in order to have the end-to-end -end transparency, the piece of cybersecurity and making sure where the firewalls are and that each party is protected is a key piece if we're ever going to get to end-to-end -to -end visibility. Excellent. Perfect. Um, so... I guess bringing in Greg there, obviously Kendra and Cindy have mentioned a lot of different po uh, points around barriers. Is there anything you'd like to add on, on that topic? Yeah, I think um, Cindy had a great point there. And, and I'll tell you, we've uh, had our challenges with cybersecurity and, and people trying to penetrate um, our organizations as well. And I think that's a, a huge, huge factor, um, especially for the transportation providers out there. So, you know, it's... It seems like uh, technology continues to change so rapidly, and it's hard, uh, to be honest, it's hard to keep up because everybody's got um, a little bit different type of tool or technology that they're trying to test or gain visibility to, and, and now you've got um, a lot of third-party providers out there that are introducing new technology back into, uh, you know, uh, carriers like myself, and uh, it, it's hard to figure out which one do you take on? Which one do you adapt to? Because not it, not every one of them can actually provide the exact same thing to, um, you know, what Cindy was talking about earlier. And, and honestly, I'm just not sure uh, that there's, there's a, a silver bullet out there just yet. But, uh, you know, we're all working towards that visibility because it's becoming more and more important, especially with COVID right now. So uh, a lot of, a lot of good thought here. Excellent. So, so bringing in Eric, we've had a, a question from from the audience around overloading of information. So, one one gentleman has mentioned that you know it's great to have end-to-end -end visibility, but his concern is there'll just be too much information, and there's already a struggle around that. What what would you say to that point? Um, I don't know how everyone else is, and uh, COVID has certainly uh, exacerbated it. I'm sure we're all suffering from information overload. Um, and I think to combat that, um, you really have to take a look at the primary responsibilities of the roles 
And then I believe it goes back to that mechanism for how we absorb information. So if I'm getting, you know, 15 different spreadsheets in a day, part of my job is, you know, compiling those and extracting some sort of action or activity from them. Um, and, you know, all the while dealing with emails and uh, Slack messages or uh, whatever the other things may be. I think that, you know, in my role in product and technology is evaluating what the outcome is supposed to be from that role and that person, and then giving them new tools to help them deal with all of that complexity. To me, again, it comes back to sometimes visualization. Uh, sometimes it comes back to uh, thinking about that role and the component of what they're doing and whether it, you know, is appropriately designed. Um, and then also thinking about the outcome that we're trying to achieve. Um, and really trying to distill out the things that are, um, you know, perhaps a little bit extraneous or aged. Um, you know, we are in different times. Uh, supply chains have changed. Uh, the players, and many have represented here, um, and, and how they are expected to work have changed. So I do think that it takes, you know, reevaluating the roles uh, and the mechanisms for how those roles function to help combat the information overload that we're all dealing with. Excellent. So, so bringing in Kendra, what would you say to the point around kind of information overload? I think it's a real risk. And I do think it's a place where technology can make a play. So, if, and, and Eric keeps talking about visualization. I, I also think that's really important. So if you can enable those folks in key roles to have tools that let them visualize what's going wrong in the supply chain, right? So uh, obviously they can see everything, but let's bring to the forefront anything that's going wrong or could potentially go wrong and let people act on that and see that immediately, then I think they don't have to worry about the stuff that's going right. <laughs> um, and, and that's where you can kind of have a filter and control um, so that people aren't overwhelmed. They know where to focus, they know where to put their attention and they know what to act on. Excellent, perfect. So bring in in the, in the in the next topic obviously you know data has come up a lot there's always conversations around prescriptive analytics predictive analytics i think a lot of people do get confused around these terms and kind of the general concept of, of big data so i guess bring in bring in cindy what does the concept of big data actually mean in a practical sense for supply chain well i think eric hit on this a little bit as we talk about how much data can actually come in there's some level of compartmental mentalization that is required in order to really extract what you need. So predictive, um, prescriptive is quantified data, but predictive allows us to get ahead of the demand. And so to the degree that you can get to accurate predictive analytics that allows you to prepare in advance all across your supply chain, your labor force, your make, move and sell, all of that, predictive really enables that and allows you to be a lot more proactive. Now I would share, and I'm sure many of you feel this way, we're in a time that it's hard to be predictive. The history is no longer a predictor of the, past, of the future um, because it is in such an uncertain demand time that we don't know exactly what's happening. But predictive becomes efficient and allows you to proactively plan the entirety of your supply chain. Excellent. So something that's come up a lot in, in the questions from the audience is obviously risk. And obviously we have this pandemic that we are, we're all bored of talking about. And when you have, you know, hurricane season, you have all sorts of issues that, that can arise given the nature of, of global supply chains. Um, so in terms of collaboration and, and just risk management, bringing in Eric, how can, I guess, collaboration and risk management, you know, help you with the abundance of supply chain disruptions that we're seeing in the world right now? Um, I, I really appreciate Cindy bringing up that idea of uh, predictive analytics, which segues into the concepts of collaboration uh, and dealing with uh, network disruptions. Um, I believe that if we, if you have focused already on beginning to enable some of the foundational things that permit predictive analytics, that permit you to uh, see uh, issues before they come up, then you can begin to extend on those foundations um, and react better to issues. Um, sometimes you can't, however. Uh, things will happen. Um, you know, when COVID hit my company, for example, um, the demand patterns completely shifted uh, for not only where people would ask for product, but the levels, volumes, uh, and sources of that demand. We had multiple orders in the 
300 to 600,000 unit range for things like school systems, um, Los Angeles, New York, et cetera. Um, and as you can imagine for a supply chain, that looked like the snake coming through the bowling, or, or a snake swallowing a bowling ball. Um, that's just not a normal demand pattern for us and was completely unpredictable. Um, we were able to combat that, however, by evaluating uh, not only the existing supply that was available for those, but also alternate supplies. So whether it was a different place to get that product from, a different product that met the need for that demand, um, and some creative ways of, of doing logistics and operations to move that around, we were able to substantially meet the demands that we had that, again, were completely unanticipated. So I think that's an example of where our visibility of knowing where we had both existing supply and potential supply, um, the collaboration that we had with those suppliers and the collaboration as well with the customer um, that you know, helped us prioritize what they really needed, where they really needed it, um, permitted us to respond to that pretty effectively, actually. Excellent. So, so bringing in Cindy around, you know, what Eric mentioned there around collaboration and, you know, there's so many disruptions going on. How do you, you know, foster that collaboration to maintain the agility in your, in your supply chain? Yeah, I'd actually look at this one more broadly than supply chain and really talk about an enterprise wide view. Um, COVID, the one huge benefit that I saw, um, if we can say there's a benefit of it, is the way it, um, uh, it brought all the enterprise functions together. And a single objective, every team was focused on keeping the stores open and keeping our team members safe, right? And so when you mobilize in that way, and because we, we are a global brand, um, we took the learnings across the world as this pandemic moved and across all of the functions. So I would say this was, for us, was well beyond just a supply chain view and working collaboratively with every function because we all had the same objective, safety and continue to serve our customers. And when you're all working at just those two objectives and, and not competing agendas, uh, it, you can do wonders across your enterprise. Excellent. Cindy, if I may. Sorry, Nicholas. Um, I love that you mentioned a silver lining um, and it can be difficult to find one these days, but I encourage everyone out there, don't let a crisis go to waste. Um, for us, I would share there have been goals that we've had as an organization that we've long had, uh, you know, the entire time I've been at the firm. And only with the advent of this crisis have we actually kind of gathered the will and the um, determination to actually address them. So, you know, whatever your biggest pain point may be out there, um, I would certainly encourage you to begin to build that business case perhaps related to this crisis um, and you know, pursue rallying the resources that will help you address it. So you know, things that meet just kind of basic customer expectations in this day and age, the ability to buy online pickup in store, um, the ability to have a touchless uh, delivery relationship, um, again, for us as a retailer is super important. Those were things that we were on a slower roadmap to, but we've certainly accelerated those now. So again, it is a bit of a silver lining to be able to take advantage of you know, the challenges that we have now to achieve outcomes that you've been looking for all the time. If I could jump in, I suppose, with another question. I think that's a really good point, Eric. Um, COVID-19 has been a catalyst for many industries in terms of driving innovation and accelerating that pace of change. And what we seem to have outlined as, as a group here is, is the, the the possibilities of visibility. So starting with that, um, the breaking down of silos, whether internally or externally, making that visibility real time, and then using that real time visibility to um, empower predictive capabilities. Um, but with the kind of the, the change in the, in the environment at the moment and COVID-19 kind of accelerating innovation, where are we at as an industry in that conversation? Is it that foundational part where we need to work on interoperability, both technical and cultural, or are we as an industry further ahead than that, where really the focus is on that kind of predictive aspect? Um, perhaps Kendra, if I could pick on you for, for that one. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question actually. Um, and as I'm sure you're expecting, the answer is probably it depends, right? So Ryder actually has a customer advisory board where we bring together our top customers and we had a very similar conversation with them, right? Where are you on, we call it the digitization journey. 
Uh, and we had everyone plot it on a board. And as you could imagine, some were very much at the beginning and some felt that they were very, very far along. So I think what we've seen is, is every customer or every um, company out there has invested differently over time on technology uh, and really focused on visualization, or, excuse me, visualizing their supply chain or digitizing their supply chain, or again, the predictive prescriptive analytics but how much have they really brought that to life into fruition? And COVID, to everyone's point, it's forcing that. And a lot of times the biggest challenge is um, the change management aspect. You might have the technology in place, but getting your people to get on board and make the changes or um, other partners within the supply chain to get on board and make those changes can be very challenging. And I think COVID really is an accelerator of all of this. So. Not only are you seeing people pump more money in, but you're really seeing things actually start to bubble up to the surface and be utilized and be taken advantage of and that cultural change take hold. So uh, again, my answer is it depends on the company and where they are, but, but I, I really do think that the foundation's in place now and we're really seeing people start to grab hold of it and run with it. Excellent. So I, I guess bringing in, bringing in Cindy there to, I guess, Eric and, and Kendra's points there around the acceleration and you know maybe projects that were on the back burner that were nice to haves and not must haves and now all of a sudden they're front and centre. How how has that been as a process for for, for Domino's? Yeah, um, I'll go back to what Kendra said. It depends um, on the maturity of the organisation. As I look around all of our franchise organisations around the world, um, and what I would also share is. The demand and also around the world in our particular business has been inconsistently high across the world. So getting to predictive has been very challenging. Predictive is a subset of the last four weeks, right? It is not a subset of what has happened the past six months. It's actually a very near in subset that we are trying to predict going forward. Um, I would share that we probably err on the over versus the under in proactive planning at this stage of the game. We would rather be over um, prepared, whether it be in, you know, from a supply demand perspective, than err on the under. Um, so there's, there's part of that process. I would also share, you know, we heavily work in business continuity planning. I know, you know, we've talked about the hurricane season, and I, I know that's going to be more of the discussion. Hurricane season tends to be regional uh, when you plan for your business continuity uh, and your supply security. Uh, in this case, it, it's hard to regionally business continuity plan a pandemic, right? Because if the nation goes down or your supply base goes down, you now have a national crisis, not a regional localized one. Um, so I would say for us particularly, predictive, is, is very near in at this stage and will likely continue to be so until we know where that baseline, where we've reestablished the baseline, because the baseline has moved the pandemic. Definitely, so, so bringing in Greg here, obviously a lot's been mentioned around business continuity, risk management. How have you guys kind of managed that situation? You know, it, it's been um, pretty interesting to say the least. We, we had a business continuity plan in, in all of our organization, however, what we didn't realize was the pandemic created something that was completely different from what we were expecting. We were considering, you know, being based in Joplin, Missouri, for example, we had one of the worst tornadoes hit us back in 2011. And needless to say, you know, we created a really strong continuity plan to be prepared for. This was a complete different type of continuity plan and it was very reactionary. However, uh, we were very fortunate to be able to pull off and, and provide services to our customers. But I think the big thing from, you know, I'll, I'll call it the tail here of the dog, uh, which is where typically the assets sit, is that it's really, we've got to become more adaptable, more flexible, and be able to adjust accordingly. And I think that's been the biggest takeaway from uh, a transportation provider's view is that, Ultimately, we, we have to be able to adjust to what our cu customers' needs are. And, uh, you know, just a prime example of that, <clears throat> 35 to 40% of our business that we actually managed on a continual basis in Q1 was not there in Q2. So we had to figure out how to adjust accordingly to make sure that the providers that are still uh, shipping and providing food and products to all the consumers at the time 
that we was able to uh, adjust accordingly. And, and I think that is uh, really the hard part for, um, you know, again, the tail of the dog at this point is being flexible and understanding what are the requirements? How do we make sure that we're tied into what our consumers and customers are needing? And then being able to invest in those tools and technology to be able to get it there. And I think that, you know, the biggest challenge from our perspective is, again, it's that ever-changing world, ever-changing environment, and each shipper has their own view of what they need. And, um, you know, I think from a, uh, a provider that uh, is, is really trying to adjust and adapt, it becomes a challenge almost day in and day out to be able to figure out how do we provide all that tools and information to the customers. And what we found is even when we do provide that information, uh, a lot of the data and a lot of the information that we're providing, nobody's even paying attention to, which is, you know, concerning and, and, and frustrating in that sense, because we're making big investments in that technology to be able to get it there. But then ultimately, if nobody's using it, nobody's viewing those reports or, or taking that data, uh, it, it becomes more of a challenge for all of us, I think. Definitely. So I guess bringing in, in Kendra, obviously what Greg mentioned speaks heavily to the change management aspect of things and bringing in, you know, maybe data to, you know, some aspects of the industry that maybe aren't as data literate as maybe we'd want them to be. How um, at Ryder are you kind of maybe necessitating that change management? So there's not more situations like Greg mentioned where you have all this great data, but just no one's using it. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think what Greg is talking about is, is very real. Um, and what we see a lot in the industry is at the executive level, um, people are looking for their 3PL partners like Ryder to have made really significant investments in technology and be able to bring that to the forefront. That's very important. But when you get to the person on, on the ground who's been in the role for 30 years, they want to do it the way they've always done it. Um, and and I, I really think that's some of the, the challenge that, that Greg is speaking to. And so we have put a huge emphasis on change management. So as we roll out new technology, and I mentioned earlier, RiderShare is one of our newest platforms that's really leveraging a lot of the visualization going on in the, um, in the supply chain today. As we're deploying that, we're literally doing it customer by customer with deployment teams and training teams, and we're, we're really hand-holding our customers through that process. And what we're measuring is adoption. So it's, it's not enough just to say, hey, we've, we've given the technology to the customer. The question is, are they adopting the technology? Are they utilizing it in their day-to-day? -day? Because if they're not, then, then it was a waste on all parts, right? So um, we really spend a lot of time on that training and retraining and going back and surveying customers and measuring um, their results. So that, that to us is, is that only way to kind of manage that change management process, even though it's not our employees, it's really important we get the customers using the technology and, and you know, hopefully finding the value in the technology. Excellent. So, so bringing, in, bringing in Greg, uh, no, bringing in, sorry, Eric here, obviously we mentioned there around, you know, you have these cool technologies and then the change management is the issue. Um, how at T-Mobile have you guessed fostered that that change management so the adoption of these cool new technologies um actually happens if that makes sense yeah no and there's a, a question in the q a that's similar around um you know uh, achieving the change um couple of things um we have a ton of changes going on internally and what i have found does not work is when it's just presented as a mandate um, when people are not part of the participation along the way, um, and that there's just an expectation of I've you know I've dictated that you're going to use a new tool or we're going to start to measure you in this way, um, and it goes beyond training. It goes beyond um, you know just putting those things out there. What I have found most effective is identifying, because there's a great continuum, you know, uh, Kendra talked about it from, you know, all the different partners uh, in the supply chain, there are very disparate um, uh, digital maturity, uh, technical maturity, et cetera. Um, what I have found is effective is identifying where first you have um, a good relationship um, and an interest, ideally, uh, in collaborating and absorbing something new, um, establishing uh, in partnership the first um, you know, piece of change that you're trying to do. Um, again, in my role of you know, bringing technology to life, um, I can't just uh, say what I think is best, you know, that my business partner that is the target of that, and again, who has an interest, 
has to be participative in um, defining what it is. Uh, transparency is the second part, um, showing them how we're doing it along the way. And then, you know, getting that first win um, and showing the business partner that, you know, this new piece of digital technology meets your needs, does it better, faster, more effectively, you know, whatever the measure is than we've done it before. Um, when we have taken that approach, I have seen a, uh, just a mushroom of, of adoption and of demand for these new technologies. Um, you know, I can speak specifically in our reverse supply chain, which as you can imagine in a um, mobile provider um, is both incredibly important for the customer relationship and far more complex than the forward uh, supply chain. Um, we have, that was one of the areas that we focused in. We had good partnership and an interest in doing this. Um, it took us about 18 months, but we've completely uh, changed from uh, what I would call a traditional integration and a traditional technology stack in our reverse space to a fully digital integration and digital stack. That business partner is probably one of my marquee um, uh, advertisers for taking the digital approach. They have seen that once we invested, it, it took a lot, it, it's not something that happens overnight, got our digital foundation in place, they now have the flexibility, they have the visibility that they are looking for. They can ask and demand for you know, data or a trend um, and the ability to understand, was it the last six months that was meaningful or the last four weeks that was meaningful? Where does it look like we're going? Um, and they can get that relatively quickly. Um, sometimes, you know, the same day, or it may be uh, self-service. So, you know, we've gone from, again, a very traditional kind of old-fashioned stack um, to a much more digitally based one in that particular space. Um, and we do have uh, business partners now who are delighted with that and continuing to demand more and more, which we're happy to provide. Excellent. So just going back to something that I guess, um, Cindy, you mentioned earlier around the unpredictability of demand. Uh, there's obviously um, a key silo that maybe we haven't spoken about yet within organizations with operations and sales. Um, can you talk to, I guess, the collaboration that you need to do with the you know, marketing and sales team in order to you know, deliver that customer experience that, that Domino's wants to, if that makes sense? Sure. Um, a few years ago, knowing that there was a gap in that particular space, we heavily engaged with our analytics and insights team. Uh, that group monitors consumer and customer behavior for us um, and really at a regional and localized and national level. So once we engaged with them and we sat down to really talk about and align on the objective of what does that visibility do? How does it allow us to service our customer better? So we partnered with them and also with our IT function and they developed that forward looking demand model. And it takes into account every individual store's sales, right, and other promotional events or weather-related events that might be going on in a localized region. We would never have, as a supply chain organization, would never have been able to do that because we don't have the connection to the store. So between the partnership with analytics and with IT, converting what they look at as sales demand into what supply chain units are sold and that connection across the data infrastructure, that has helped us with the predictive aspect. But there is usually not a way that you are going to remain in your little functional silo and do that on your own and service the business. So everyone needs to play a part and the collaboration we had with our IT and analytics team was excellent. Um, that's how we got to that predictive place from a demand perspective. Perfect. So I, I guess bringing in you know, Eric there around the collaboration with, with sales and marketing, how do you guys do it at, at T-Mobile? Um, you know, one of our earlier questions was around silos and, um, you know, why are they prevalent? Uh, what drives them? I kind of go back to organization. You know, over time, organizations have built up, um, you know, they hire talent, um, they determine their own ways of working. Um, and sometimes, again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That can be effective in more stable times. Um, you know, again, we've all, we've been talking about the disruption uh, in this conversation and we've all been experiencing it. Um, another way that we have begun thinking about this at T-Mobile is as journeys. So cutting across the silos of function and taking it really from a customer perspective and creating an organization that is tasked with that end-to-end -end view 
has been a way that we've been effective in um, fostering the um, pursuit of some of these uh, business outcomes that I was talking about earlier. Um, and so I, I do think it comes back to org. Org is both the problem and potentially the solution. Um, and specifically, again, that role that is charged with thinking across the silos and bringing together the resources, whether it's human resources, technical resources, et cetera, um, to achieve that outcome that you're looking for. So that's one way that we've been effective with it at T-Mobile. Excellent. So one topic that you know has, has been on the back burner somewhat given everything that's been going on in, in 2020 has been um, you know carbon emissions, uh, sustainability, uh, climate change, et cetera. Bringing in, bringing in Kendra, what are your thoughts on how, I guess, supply chain visibility, digitizing your supply chain can help to reduce carbon footprint um, and just help us with this, you know, climate change issue that we see in the world right now? You know, it's interesting. I see that as a natural result of a digital supply chain. And what I mean by that is, is when you're able to see a uh, supply chain in real time um, and you're able to pro solve problems real time, then you should really have less miles, right? So you should be able to control better the freight movements and ensure they're op in optimal position um, and that you're getting into the right point of sale. You should be able to optimize the use of trailer space and we should be getting it right more often the first time. So I really see digitizing the supply chain as resulting in less, or maybe I should say shorter movement of goods, fewer miles driven, less returns, um, and this will just continue to create efficiencies. So again, I really see it as a natural result of this. And I think as we've all said on this call, COVID's driving this even further. Um, so I think we're seeing a little bit, we will, uh, when we kind of come out of this, uh, as, a, as we have more digital information with our supply chains, I think we'll continue to see this reduction in carbon footprint. So um, it's a really exciting natural result of the efficiencies that um, a digital supply chain will create. Excellent. So Greg, to, to Kendra's point, not just, I guess, around uh, you know, carbon emissions and, and the need to maybe drive that down, but more generally around efficiency, efficiency gains. How can, you know, supply chain visibility help us, um, you know, get more f efficient supply chains, if that makes sense? Yeah, I, I think from our point of view, the, the best thing that can happen is the, the more information that we can have on the front end, the better off we're going to be able to be. So you, you think about today in, in a truckload environment, um, on average, our drivers sit anywhere from 15 to 18 hours a week uh, in dwell time. So meaning that they're either waiting for their next load or waiting to be offloaded. And if you just think about that amount of time across, you know, call it a 2,000 truck fleet, that's over 30,000 hours a week that is, I'll call it one being wasted that's non-productive for the drivers and or the equipment, but secondarily, um, you know, spinning off some type of carbon emissions to the environment. And I think, you know, from, from our standpoint, the, the more that we can have that predictive environment, which is a perfect world, right? We're all trying to get there. And, and, and I don't know that we ever will, but as close as we can, the more that we can drive that down, the better off we're all going to be. And, and, and being, I'll call it a little bit more green than what we are today. And, and as, you know, an asset provider, that's one of the biggest things is we're trying to figure out, one, how to wa uh, drive waste out of our business, and secondarily, really trying to focus on, um, you know, as new technology comes out in equipment and, and trying to figure out ways to uh, minimize that footprint, uh, that's exactly where we're trying to go. And, and uh, you know, there, there's a long way to go, I think, in the technology space yet from a, a trucking perspective, but, you know, we're we're – watching and, and waning and hoping that uh, you know there's some really good things that will come to the environment but to me visibility is the key and i think kendra hit it so excellent so bring in cindy for i guess the domino's perspective on efficiency and i guess specifically on, on carbon emissions how are you guys kind of working through that process well greg really uh hit on a number of topics that you know is similar to what we're doing um first he talked about dwell time uh we idle often uh, to keep the refrigeration units running. And that obviously creates a lot. We are probably a high idler uh, in the industry because we run those refrigeration units. So um, visibility to the baseline of the data, what are we actually emitting 
and how do we get better? You need to know where you are in order to know where you need to go. So we are actually um, over the next 12 to 18 months in the process of, of looking at some of these baselines, whether it be water usage, whether it be GHG, how much are we contributing? We drive a lot of miles, as does any transportation provider. Um, and the reduction in mileage, you know, as, as we track, um, all of that will play into uh, what we are looking at doing in terms of creating our roadmap for ESG, honestly. Uh, I'd be surprised if most corporations aren't going down that path, but you need to know where you are. We'll look at miles, we'll look at dwell, we'll look at idle, we'll look at, in our particular case as well, our packaging to our consumer. We obviously, um, give out a lot of pizza boxes. Uh, so I would say for us, as I look at the total uh, environmental impact, we will look across the platforms at that. Excellent, perfect. So um, a topic that we haven't discussed is, is 5G. Obviously, um, Eric has, you know, our resident 5G expert. I was just wondering if you wanted to just discuss how, you know, 5G can maybe accelerate or help with, you know, the supply chain visibility discussion that we've been speaking about today. You know, um, back in the advent of um, earlier technologies for network, um, you know, we thought that we were going to just be <clears throat> uploading pictures that much faster to the internet, yet we've now turned into whole new platforms, um, you know, TikTok, Instagram, et cetera, uh, lots of videos, YouTube, um, those things were not predicted as part of the earlier technologies. And I think it is very difficult to see the future uh, with the advent of 5G. Some things that we know now um, and opportunities that we have around visibility are far, far more um, passive solutions for understanding the disposition of what's happening. Whether it's things like in maintenance, for example. Um, and we had a great uh, example of predictive analytics at, uh, in my last role, um, it wasn't even in my space uh, particularly, but of understanding trends with uh, maintenance of um, air conditioning systems and knowing where we needed to get in ahead of that and also knowing what the uh, ROI was because we could predict what the impact on sales would be um, if an air conditioning unit were to go down, say, in Miami. Uh, nobody wants to be in a hot store browsing and, and trying on uh, garments. So um, in, with the advent of 5G um, in the supply chain space, you're going to have um, uh, connectors which will let you understand uh, disposition, position, um, and level of inventory or all of the other components of your supply chain. It could be, you know, where are my trucks? Um, it could be how much inventory is in that location. Has that inventory uh, changed disposition? So, you know, in the fresh food space, um, you know, there will be uh, 5G components that will help monitor the freshness of, you know, the tomato sauce and the dough or whatever it might be uh, for a company like Domino's. So, and those are the things, only the things we can predict. Um, so much more will come. Um, and uh, I think, again, it's going to have huge impacts on supply chain, which then gets to the need to continue to pursue uh, digitization now to enable the consumption of all of these new signals and then the combination of them into actions that you can actually you know, re respond to um, or predict um, so that you can be in the right position, again, to meet your business objectives and to meet customer expectations. Excellent. So I guess bringing in Kendra, obviously there's a lot of excitement around 5G and it seems, you know, perfect for the conversation we've having. What are your thoughts, I guess, on the opportunity and I guess the excitement around what the, uh, the technology kind of offers for the space? Yeah, I really want to second a lot of what Eric was saying. So when you talk about, you know, Internet of Things or, or really sensor technology, which is a lot of what Eric was referring to, that's where I think the big opportunity is. Um, in today's world, a lot of people talk about it and it's done in pockets, but I, I wouldn't say it's really done in a broad perspective. And we're getting all of that data and information that we really could use and leverage to make better information about our supply chain. Um, and honestly, I don't know that we're all ready for that either. So I, I really agree with what he was saying. I, I think we need to continue to take our organizations and our supply chain partners down the path of digitizing the supply chain. 
Um, and as we do that, and as 5G grows, I think that the sensor technology will really enable us to get even better and smarter and more predictive with all this. So I, I think it's very exciting. Um, I agree, we, we're not 100% sure yet what it's going to lead to in the end. That's, that's part of what makes it fun. Um, but it's, it's a huge opportunity in this space. Excellent. So obviously something that is key to you know all of this is is folks like yourselves, the, the key talent that, that drives a lot of these transformations. So, so bringing in Greg, how are you guys, I guess, attracting that technical expertise to help you overcome some of the challenges that we've spoken about today? Yeah, I think uh, it's a great question. I would tell you part of part of the challenge is, um, you know, we are at the crossroads of America, right in the middle of the United States and, uh, you know, known as one of the best areas for trucking. However, um, you know, it's not a very large population. And so we've really had to reach out into other markets specifically to find that talent to be able to support. Uh, we've got a great group of people that support our businesses. Um, and, and I feel very fortunate that we've got the talent that we have um, because they've been in the industry for many, many years. But, you know, now with all the new tools and technology, um, we're really having to, to figure out a different way to approach that. And, and honestly, it's really been um, being a little bit more flexible, a little bit more adaptive and trying to uh, find that specific niche of uh, expertise that we need. And, and trying to figure out where we can place those folks to where um, they still uh, are, are attached to our business unit, but not necessarily so far away that they're on an island on their own. So it's been a challenge. Um, you know, in, in our segment of the business, we're, uh, you know, in, in a lot of cases, the trucking industry is still operating, um, you know, maybe uh, 10 to 20 years behind uh, the rest of the environment. So it's really uh, we're playing a lot of catch up right now in the industry, and I think it's important uh, to continue to try to attract that talent as quickly and as efficiently as we can. Excellent. So bringing in Cindy, obviously, this is an exciting time. Obviously, Eric and, and Kendra mentioned around, you know, the opportunities for 5G. And, you know, we've seen so much acceleration over the last five months due to due to the pandemic. Can you, I guess, talk to your excitement and just what your thoughts are on the future? Um, of, of supply chain and digitization and visibility, if that makes sense. Oh, I'd love it if we would get in my lifetime, which we probably will not get to, um, not having to touch the supply chain, as I spoke about earlier. That would be the holy grail of, you know, the demand to your customer base feeding all the way back to what you input to supply chain. Um, what I will share is there's just tremendous opportunity to link what happens in supply chain with our consumer base. If I really look at it and compartmentalize it, um, and I think about um, uh, what Kendra had said as well, if I was sitting here as a marketer, I might tell you that for my customer base, I'd like to be able to share with them when their mushrooms were picked or when their peppers were harvested or what farm they came from. It would be pretty amazing if we had some digitization that could really connect us to our consumer. That's what gets us repetitive customer base. So when we can connect supply chain aspects to our customer to grow our revenue and our business, that will be a win. Um, so we would look to see how we can use digitization to do that at some future point, in addition to just the efficiency that you would be able to get um, within the supply chain itself. But our customer, first and foremost, we exist because of our customer. Um, and so we need, you know, we will protect and take care of them first. Excellent. So I guess bringing in Eric, they obviously mentioned around 5G, but just kind of more broadly, can you talk about the excitement there is maybe in supply chain in the industry and just, I guess, mentioning what, what Cindy spoke to? Uh, I, that is a great and exciting example of both how uh, a combination of 5G and digitization and new technologies are going to enable whole new experiences uh, for companies and for consumers. Um, you know, and I think that's a great one. Um, you know, the sensors in place to understand passively what's happening with, you know, growing seasons um, for the ingredients for pizzas, to track those and then to share with customers, um, you know, these mushrooms uh, five days ago were in the ground um, in an adjacent state um, and you're getting to enjoy them today, brought to you by Domino's. So <clears throat> I think it's things like that. Um, I think that um, there are so many experiences and things out there that we're beginning to see as uh, new paradigms 
um, we were talking a little bit earlier about the idea of refining our plans based on whether it's history, experience, uh, et cetera, to get a better prediction for how the supply chain will behave. We're thinking about now um, ways to respond um, when the supply chain uh, changes or when things happen in, in the supply chain. So for example, you know, uh, retailers long have tried to make the right prediction, put the right product in the right place for the demand. And we think of ourselves as a fashion retailer. You know, our, our phones are style, color, size, just like pants and shirts. Um, and it's super, super important to get the right fit, whether it's apparel or whether it is the phone. Um, and so obviously we try to put um, uh, product in the right place to meet customer demands, you know, right uh, assortment in stores. Um, we're now thinking of ways that even when it's not, because you're never going to get it right when you, um, when you just make a plan, uh, you can't exactly predict customer demand. Um, we're looking at digitization and ways to respond to that where we can pull from inventory at any uh, location. Um, and that's a new capability that has come to us um, brought by our digital foundation. Um, and it helps optimize our inventory. I think this is super applicable both in trucking industry, in um, you know, the provision of transportation. Um, and again, knowing at a moment, providing, for example, um, you know, uh, for either of the other panelists, um, here's what's in flight on the road, its exact position, and if a customer uh, had a technology to send in a different demand signal, you could divert that truck right then. It doesn't have to go where it was going. You can change the route, you can change um, you know, the stops along the way. So I think it's things like that, um, that again are gonna bring those transformative experiences for companies and for customers in the end, uh, consumers in the end, um, with the combination of digital, 5G, and other technologies that are coming into play. It's, it's very exciting. Excellent. So um, the heavens have opened in London. So it's, uh, I think we've timed the webinar quite well. And uh, as I guess as we wrap up, wanted to bring in Kendra. Obviously, I think there is a lot of excitement going on right now with 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 the future of supply chain. Obviously, you mentioned uh, that. I would, mm -hmm. I guess, I would like you to, I guess, conclude and just summarize what we've spoken about today, and really kind of talk about the opportunity and the excitement in this space, kind of going forward. Sure, I'd love to. Thank you. So um, this has been a great conversation. I've, I've loved it. I love the engagement. Uh, and I think reflecting on what we've really spoken about, started about started out with um, how do we bring visualization to the supply chain, but then really moving upstream to digitizing all the information that we have, and then talking about the future of what that could bring. And as I was listening, especially to the conversation at the end, one thing that really hit me is, is the focus on the customer experience um, and exactly what Cindy was describing. Supply chains have always, or I shouldn't say always, but they've been thought of as kind of a necessity and then maybe that's the extent of them, right? But now we're seeing with, by digitizing the supply chain and bringing all this information to the forefront that supply chains can have a really significant impact on the customer experience and and that that can obviously have a huge impact on sales and and that's where it gets fun that's where it gets exciting that's where it gets interesting and and technology is really enabling all of this um so as, as we look forward I, I think as the conversation has said it's it's really about breaking down the silos and and um, from where i sit as a 3pl i think of those silos as, as bringing together all of the various players within a supply chain so how do we bring them together enable the, everyone to see the same information at the same time, act on that information together, and really bring forward that customer service aspect and that best customer experience. And it, it, it aligns with everything everyone's been talking about on this call. So it's been great. It's been very fun, and I, I really appreciate it. Excellent. Well, that's a great, I guess, passionate and, and happy way to uh, to end um, end today's webinar. Um, this will be available on demand, so this will be sent out to everyone next week. So if you want to rewatch anything that was said um, during during this webinar, then feel free to. Um, but that wraps everything up today. Really enjoyed it. Thanks to all of the all the panelists and Jamie. Um, you know being there just in case uh, so really appreciate that um, and hopefully we, we get to see you guys on a, on a future webinar really soon thanks a lot thanks Nicholas. thank you thanks Nick.